Hello. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, could I get uh, just a quick show of hands from people? Um, how, many's, uh, how many people's first time is it to the Philosophy Forum here tonight? Steve, is this your first time? Really? Wow. Okay. Wow. Cool. I thought you would have been here more. Okay, cool. We're, gonna, we're probably going to be doing one in a couple of weeks that I really want to talk to you about. Okay? Cool. Um, yeah, okay. Well, awesome. Um, so there's a really big caveat that needs to be said about all of this stuff. And that is that what we're doing here tonight um, is setting the stage for a debate that's going to be taking place between you and so several times throughout the night, we're going to be breaking for small group discussion. And I think that's where a lot of the magic comes in. Um, I need to give like this massive thank you to Justin Simpson, who's just been a huge hand on setting up this whole presentation. Um, if you came to the last open mic night, you probably saw him talk about climate change. Uh, so I invited him to help me with this presentation. He's been awesome. Um, that all being said, neither Justin nor myself are scientists. So um, everything that we're saying is based on the research from other scientists. So um, it, we included all of the sources and everything that we have. So if you have any questions, please do ask. Does that sound good? Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Well, uh, okay. So with all that being said, um, I can take you through a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight. So, um, as always, I think that I planned to try to fit in a bit too much, but I don't think that that's really a bad thing. We're going to see what we can do. We're going to see on the fly what maybe we choose to lob off. Um, of course, we had um, our haiku contest at the very beginning. Um, we're going to be collecting these haikus during the first small group discussion. So if you want to continue working on yours, that's awesome. Uh, or your drawing, you can definitely do that. We're going to be collecting them at the first small group discussion. Um, first, we're going to have a talk on just what is climate change. I think a lot of us maybe have some ideas about what climate change is. Maybe we don't really know what we're talking about or what causes it. So that's going to be the first thing, just to make sure that we're all on the same footing coming into this conversation. After that, we're going to look at the general global and environmental devastation as a result of climate change. After that, we're going to have a sustainable Tieng Viet crash course from Mai Chang, who's going to teach us some really awesome phrases that are really good to have in our back pocket uh, in case we want to be living a more environmentally conscious lifestyle here in Hanoi. Things like, no plastic bag, please, and uh, I have my own straw. <laughs> uh, after that, we'll take a look at um, some of the proposed governmental solutions that are out there. Um, you know, some governments are doing really great work. Some governments are really no not doing that much work. So we're going to look at that as well. Um, after that, we'll have a talk on what individuals might be able to do. Um, uh, to combat climate change. I know that especially if we don't believe in our own governments, uh, I know maybe a lot of us uh, expats are coming from countries where we're pretty disappointed in the political leadership, um, and, uh, and we're going to take a look at some of the ideas that are proposed on how we could best fight climate change just as an individual. Um, after that, Govinda Linyart, uh, Linart, who started Three Monkeys. Is anybody familiar with Three Monkeys? Three Monkeys is a killer project. I see some head nods in uh, Vietnam, they, um, they do a lot of animal rights activism, making sure that there's enough wildlife that's available for animals to live. Um, and also, he fights to clean up a lot of the natural areas around Hanoi. Um, so we're going to have a talk with him about his experience in here in Hanoi being a, um, a kind of an activist for environmental protections. Um, any questions about all those things? No? We're good? Okay. Awesome. I'm doing no deforestation November. Okay. Now that that bad joke's out of the way, we can open it up. Um, anybody, um, what, what is climate change? Can I just get a, a hand raise from anybody who'd like to start us off on this conversation? I see Mr. Scott Matt. Scott, could you tell us what you think? Yeah. Um, well, when we talk about climate change, we're probably referring to uh, human-caused climate change because it happens, like, really slowly anyway. Um, so, essentially, climate change is uh, a shift in the water cycles. Uh, it actually all has to do with water. Um, now water cycle shift because we add certain 
gases to the atmosphere that trap more heats. Um, and the atmosphere includes the air and the ocean. Um, and this causes all sorts of patterns to change that makes droughts longer, storms more intense, um, temperatures generally rise and has a whole slew of effects from uh, natural disasters uh, with increasing frequency just to, just to um, plant and agriculture cycles getting messed up like even already uh, and sea level rise even already due to flooding in the Mekong uh, the government here in Vietnam has had to put uh, export bans on rice just to prevent food shortage which is on its way to becoming a lot worse um, so maybe I want to look too far into detail but yeah yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah, you you touched on a lot of points that uh, that we're going to be getting onto later tonight. Awesome, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, who here in the audience feels like you have a pretty firm grasp about climate change and what it is? Cool. Let's say about a third of us there. Who thinks that you really maybe don't have a very firm grasp about what climate change is and what's causing it? Cool. So, what I see is that both of those groups are spread out pretty evenly along the room. That's really good. So that means that throughout tonight, we're going to be learning a lot from each other which is really nice. Um, one of the most important things when getting into this conversation is making sure that we're working uh, just with the same terminology. And one thing that's often confused when we have a conversation about climate change is the difference between weather and climate. Um, so first, to, to, to let you know, um, when we talk about climate change, this is independent of just weather. Yeah? Um, there are often climate change, change deniers who, you know, they look outside their window and they see snow, or they feel how cold it might be, and they say, oh, uh, th there's clearly no climate change here, because it's not getting warmer, that is, because it's so cold outside. What they're referring to, though, is actually weather. So weather, I'm sorry that the font is kind of small here, um, it's the state of the atmosphere at a particular place and time as regards to heat, cloudiness, dryness, sunshine, wind, rain, etc. I think that we all understand what weather is. That one's pretty easy, okay. But then climate is kind of an average of all of the weather in one particular place. Um, there are different amounts of time that different organizations use, and you'll find that in many reports that are given about climate change, they'll actually specify the way that they particularly define climate. Um, so one internationally recognized definition of climate is the average weather in a particular location over 30 years. So this is one reason why climate science is uh, actually really difficult um, sometimes to understand all that goes into it because we're working with numbers and we're working with information that's as old as three decades. There's a lot going on. Okay, so any questions then about the difference between climate and weather? Okay, that's an important one to get through. That's really good. Okay. So, then we have the word climate change. Now, the word climate change really has two different definitions. Um, so, the climate has been in constant flux since the beginning of time. Maybe you might have heard Donald Trump or some other public figures say, the climate is always changing, and it's really true. The climate is always changing and has always been changing. So, that's one way to talk about climate change. There's a second way to talk about climate change, though, which is in regard specifically to the later half of the 20th century and the incredible acceleration of the rate at which climate has been changing. So because of humans, the, the rate of change in the climate has steadily increased and increased and increased and increased and increased. So when we talk about climate change tonight, for the most part, that second definition is what we're going to be talking about. The climate has always been changing, but what what we're really talking about tonight is in particular the last, say, um, uh, I mean, you could go back, say, about 100 years, um, but especially within about the last 50 years. That all make sense to everybody? Cool. Okay. Um, so there's also the Anthropocene. Uh, the Anthropocene is the period of time that under which um, the environment has been mostly controlled by human beings, that we, you know, anthropology, the study of humans, anthro, human being, so it's the period of time during which human beings have had the most substantial effect on the world. 
So there's a term, anthropogenic, which means that it originated in human activity. So when we talk about anthropogenic climate change, we're not talking about the kind of climate change that has been going on forever, that's caused by natural uh, uh, natural ebbs and flows in the environment. But what we're actually talking about is the change to the climate that is specifically due to human beings. Cool. So, those are the important terms I think that we need to get through tonight. There are a couple more that are going to be coming up a little later on. Um, are there any questions about these before we move on? Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so now that we understand the basic terminology, I think that it's important just to, again, set a baseline for everybody to understand what causes climate change. Um, I would imagine that most of us in fourth grade or fifth grade uh, or high school or college, at some point we must have interacted um, with a lesson on the greenhouse effect, right? Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of the greenhouse effect before. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm quickly just going to review it because it's, it's really important for understanding the science here, for understanding what goes behind this. Um, so first of all, um, all of the heat that we're talking about is coming from the sun of course. Okay. So um, it's not just one sort. It's not just one kind of light, though. There are loads of different kinds of light. There's a huge spectrum of light, and each one of these is its own kind of photon. So if you think about blue light, this is a particular kind of photon, and blue light is particularly light with a lot of energy. There's also kinds of photons with less energy that tend to be on the red side of the light spectrum. Okay, there are also photons that we just can't see, a part of the invisible light spectrum, which include things like ultra ultraviolet light and infrared light. Okay, well, most of these kinds of light don't actually make it to the Earth. And that's because of the molecules that are in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is mostly made up of nitrogen, of carbon dioxide, of ozone, which is O3 here, ozone, of oxygen, and of water. That's most of our atmosphere. And then the photons, as they shoot from the sun down... God, this really feels like a lecture. This feels so goddamn boring. Are you guys with me so far? Is it okay? All right, cool. All right, thank you. I feel like we've... Uh-oh. What happened? Let's go back here. Um, I feel like we've been exploring, like, we've been exploring, like, uh, you know, polyamory and, uh, and, like, the ethics of sex work and all this, like, cool, sexy stuff recently that talking about climate change, this isn't very much fun anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to try to make it sexy for you, though, guys. I promise. Uh, okay. So, um, we have all these different molecules up here. And uh, e the molecules reflect the light back into the atmosphere. So, here's the sun if you can see it, and then the solar radiation, these photons, they go down, and then it hits each one of these different molecules, and the molecules then bounce the light back into the atmosphere. Okay, some of the photons, though, they creep their way through the molecules in the atmosphere. Um, so there are different molecules that block specifically different kinds of light. It just has to do with the natural properties of these molecules. So some of these molecules are really good at blocking UV light. Uh, that's particularly O3, the ozone layer, very good at blocking UV light. Other molecules are better at blocking red light or blue light or infrared light. Okay. Some of them, though, they make it through. Um, so, and then it's that heat that ends up heating the Earth. That's how we have heat here on the Earth. Now, what also happens, though, is that these same molecules, they block that heat from escaping the Earth's atmosphere. So they bounce back. They just stay in here. It's like the whole Earth just has this big jacket on. And any of the heat that comes in stays here in the Earth. It doesn't bounce back. It bounces back comes out, maybe some of it does actually make its way out. The Earth does lose quite a lot of this heat. Not all of it stays in from our atmosphere. Some of it's gone, some of it stays. This process of heat coming from the sun, going through the molecules, hitting the Earth, bouncing back, and getting trapped by that first layer of molecules, just like a jacket that keeps you warm, just like a greenhouse, is called the greenhouse effect. Okay. 
Does everybody get the greenhouse effect so far? Okay, cool. We all passed five, fifth grade. That's good. Cool. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's really important to say the greenhouse effect is not our enemy. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, then the Earth would actually be 30 degrees Celsius on average colder than it is right now, right? We'd still get the heat from the sun. That's all good, but it wouldn't be trapped here. So it would be totally inhabitable for human beings. So we want the greenhouse effect, but we want it at a very particular amount. We can't have too much of a greenhouse effect. We can't have too little of a greenhouse effect. We have these kind of Goldilocks conditions right now that we've been evolving to for the last hundreds of millions of years. And what we've been seeing over the last just couple of decades is an extreme change in the efficiency of the greenhouse effect and the efficiency of our atmosphere to keep this heat trapped in the earth. And that's why we're seeing this rise in temperature. <coughs> so when we normally talk about CO2, that one molecule that keeps on coming up again and again and again, when we talk about climate change, the one molecule that we talk about is CO2. Is CO2. So then there's this question, like, why is CO2 the molecule that's so efficient at trapping heat? And it turns out it's not. There's really nothing special about CO2. There are many greenhouse gases that are far more effective at trapping heat than CO2. The reason that we care so much about CO2 is because we produce so much of it. It seems like everything that we do to create comfort in our life creates CO2 as a byproduct. So all of our transportation industry, all of our agriculture, all of our industry, and all of our energy production all creates CO2 as a byproduct. So it's pumping loads and loads and loads and loads of CO2 into the atmosphere, further increasing the efficiency of this greenhouse effect, causing the heat of the earth. With me so far? We're good. We're good. Awesome. I've never felt so much like a university lecturer in my whole life than right now, actually. This is serious stuff, guys. Okay. There should be a, there should be a picture here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, the amount of CO2 right now is increasing. Um, I'm actually going to skip this one. I don't think that I wanted to have this slide in here. This is what I wanted. Um, so this graph comes from NASA, and this goes back 400,000 years. This is the best science that we have to understand the amount of carbon, to understand the amount of carbon that was in the atmosphere 400,000 years ago. When you see a lot of this data, it's coming from Antarctica. And if you don't know why, it seems a little bit strange. Why are they doing all of these measurements of temperature and all these measurements of the CO2 level in Antarctica? And it's because in Antarctica, we have all this ice that's been there for flipping ever. And because it's been there so long, we can tap into these ice cores and we can test this ice that's been the same consistency for these hundreds of thousands of years. We can look at the CO2 inside of the ice when it formed. We can look at the CO2 inside ice that's formed today and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the amount of CO2 from 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago, and then we can make these kind of extrapolated guesses going all the way back to about 400,000 years. Now, this is the graph that's given up by NASA. This is all very firm science, right? But we have estimates that go back 800 and 900,000 years about the growth of CO2, but the change and shift of CO2 in our, in our atmosphere. The important thing to notice here is that the amount of CO2, though it's fluctuated throughout time, it's never gone above this dotted line here. Um, over here on the side, I should have said this, sorry. Over here on the side, this is CO2 in parts per million, which means if you take a million molecules and you look at the number of CO2 molecules that exist within that million. That's what we're measuring here, right? So um, uh, for, you know, down here, we had about 180 molecules of CO2 for every million. The highest that it's really ever gotten in the last 400,000 years, and again, you look back, 800,000 years is the same. The highest it's ever gotten has been about 300 parts per million. 
It's only within the last few decades that we broke this barrier of 300 parts per million and we skyrocketed up to more than 400 parts per million. As of today, we have 409 carbon dioxide molecules per million molecules in our atmosphere, right? This is totally unprecedented territory. Yes, David. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, mm, uh, okay. So, this is what I wanted to show you now. So, again, these temperatures are taken from the Antarctic. This is another graph that comes from, this is another graph that comes from NASA. Um, and what we're seeing here is Antarctic temperature plotted at the same, on the same timeline as the carbon dioxide parts per million over time. And we see this extreme correlation in the amount of carbon dioxide and the temperature in the world. Again, this temperature is taken in Antarctica because they've had ice there for so long we can do these kinds of tests there that we can't really do anywhere else in the world. So we see this trend throughout time and we take this model and we project it to today. And scientists would say, okay, so there are 409 parts CO2 per million molecules in the atmosphere. According to this model, if we were to project this, how warm should the average temperature of the Earth be? And they would come up with a calculation. And they would use this calculation to find out how hot the Earth would be, and they would be correct. So their calculation would match the actual temperature of the Earth. And that's one way that we're able to check, that's one way that we're able to verify this model, one way they will verify the calculation and the correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide and the temperature in the Earth. Boy, I'm saying a lot of words. Any thoughts from anybody about all of this? Okay, we're going to have a chance for a small group discussion in just a minute, I think. We're going to get into that in just a second. But again, first of all, I just want to make sure that we all understand, you know. Before doing this project, I definitely thought that I had a pretty fair understanding of what climate change was. And through all of this, I really found, well, I didn't know very much. I didn't know very much. So I hope that we're all learning a little bit of something. Um, so this is the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. This is a UN organization. And you guys might have heard that recently they came out with a new report. And this was called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius. So for the last decade, most of the climatological research that's been done looking at the potential effects of climate change on the future world, have been done um, projecting out two degrees Celsius. What will the world look like if we were to reach two degrees Celsius, and how can we keep us from reaching two degrees Celsius? One of the reasons why two degrees Celsius was chosen as a target is because after two degrees, there is this spiral effect, that there is more carbon that's released from the... Uh, from the oceans through evaporation, creating more carbon, creating an even greater um, greenhouse effect, right? Um, many different kinds of spiral effects like that. That's why they chose two degrees. Um, recently, though, they were pressured by small island nations around the world who are most susceptible to the effects of rising sea tides. And they said, listen, if you wait until two degrees, our island is gone. You can't wait until two degrees. We have to set the bar lower. It's actually really unfair that you're setting it here. Um, one of the <laughs> One of the unfortunate things about climate change is that um, most of the nations that are affected initially by climate change, affected initially by rising sea levels, these are na nations that had nothing to do with creating the problem that we're in now. It's most of these countries that have still been developing. It was really developed nations in the West that have been producing so much carbon, so much carbon for the last century that's causing this problem. Okay, so the IPCC then, they took their recommendation and they said, okay, let's find out what would happen uh, if the Earth were to increase on average by a temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, the IPCC said, 
The world must decrease net carbon dioxide emissions by nearly 50% by 2030. So this is the goal, 50% by 2030, and eliminate them by 2050 to maintain, such, to maintain much of the planet's livability. So much of the planet will become, will become unlivable unless we meet this goal. Unlivable because of drought, unlivable because of famine, unlivable because of flooding, unlivable because of increased heat. They recognized that this is necessarily an international effort. This is not a problem that we can solve as individual nations. This is certainly not a problem we can solve as competing nations. But we must have the whole world come together to fight this problem. And we were very, very, very close to getting the whole world together to fight this problem. So, um, according to the IPCC, according to this report, if we were to do everything that we can to reduce carbon emissions down to a level that would only eventually um, create a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in global temperature, that this would cost between 1.6 and 3.8 trillion dollars annually from now until 2045. So for just about 27 years, we would have to be paying this extra price. Now, I know that 1.6 to 3.8 trillion dollars seems like a massive amount of money, and of course it is, but if we have the whole world working together on this problem, this is only 3.5% of the whole global economy. So if we were just to raise taxes. Well, I guess that's not exactly right. Yeah, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> but it is only 3.5% of the global economy. Um, any questions about this? Yeah, yeah, Scott. Um, yeah, if you want to. Not a question, but one or two comments, if that's all right. Um, so I think it's important to note also that a lot of the things that we do to meet uh, these climate goals, actually uh, the the net cost is is often positive. Usually we actually save money or make money on a lot of these things. There's a cost to implement everything. There's a cost to drill more oil. There's a cost to, 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 to dig more coal. Uh, but around the world, just you know, and energy production is just one example, but uh, it's becoming far cheaper to use a lot of renewable sources uh, than it is to uh, even continue using uh, existing coal power plants that are already built. That, that's a big case happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's going to, like here in Vietnam, that's going to hit EVN with like a lot of losses just from what they operate in coal plants. So... It costs a lot of money to do, but actually it's usually a lot more cost beneficial in the immediate term and almost in always the case in the, you know, if you look out more than like five to ten years. Um, and, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to add that this actually depends on which side of the political spectrum you're on. So one of the constant um, debates against climate change, one of the constant arguments made by climate change deniers, is that climate change is a big hoax. And the hoax, it's a Trojan horse in which people on the left are able to jump in with their own political ideologies. So when you talk about the changes that are essential, we do start talking about reallocating land, um, creating more land for the public, rather than uh, for private businesses to be able to chop down the trees. Um, we do start talking about universal basic income um, so that there aren't as many people who have to work these jobs that morally they know are wrong, but they do it anyway because they, they have to. They have to earn some money. Um, we talk about um, global educa uh, universal health care. We talk about universal education. Um, <coughs> we talk about a lot of things that tend to be ideologically left. So I agree with you, but also these, this is actually a divided issue. Yeah. Um, I kind of, I kind of want to hear from. Some, I think there was one other person. Yeah, a quick one. Yeah, please, please, please. Um, <laughs> this will be like a couple seconds. But um, so okay. Usually, I, I, I don't, I don't really de uh, define this as a as a partisan issue. I don't even really consider myself entirely on the left. Um, 
it's 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 easy to have a back and forth, but there are there are there are solid numbers. Uh, if it, you know, the example I gave with Cole, it's not it's not a debate. There is no two sides. If you actually look at the numbers, it's it's very much just how it is. Um, and things like you know the increasing in solar in uh, industry that doesn't involve universal education, all this stuff. That's that's. That's nice to get distracted by, but these are really things that are making money and way more jobs. It's 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 not a debate. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, maybe I can hear from one more person, and then we're gonna move on. Yeah, please. So, in terms of having to uh, like radically change our ways and how much that will cost us to reduce or to prevent global temperatures rising above 1.5 degrees pre-industrial. Levels by 2045 maybe would cost 1.63.8 trillion dollars. I don't know the numbers exactly, but when you look at the amount of long-term costs that you'd save from sea defense alone in terms of blocking off the sea, this is only from sea level rise, which is one very small problem. The amount that that would cost by even 2100 is in the, I th believe it was a it was in the trillions. I can't remember the figures exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was a lot more than 3.8 trillion. So it depends if you're short or long sighted. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And of, of course, all of this requires first a fundamental belief in the scientific method, a fundamental belief in peer review, a belief in modern scientists. And there are many countries around the world, my own country, whose politicians are actually fighting against the scientific establishment. Um, I'm not on that side of the spectrum, by the way, but I just I think it's important to say that there are there are both of these things. And um, it seems like mm, yeah, it seems like every part of this can actually be debated, which is why we're here. Cool. Okay. Um, so, um, right now, uh, to actually get into it, uh, it looks like only about half of Americans, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, a lot of this data always comes to the United States. There's just so much polling that happens in the USA. Um, but only about half of Americans are sure that global warming is actually happening. Um, the other half is unsure whether or not global warming is happening. It does seem like the numbers are, are on the rise, though, which is good. Um, and then we come to the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, who said the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make the U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. He also said snowing in Texas and Louisiana, record-setting freezing temperatures throughout the country and beyond. Global warming is an expensive hoax. NBC News just called it the Great Freeze. Coldest weather in years. Is our country still spending money on the global warming hoax? <sighs> Give me clean, beautiful, healthy air, not s the same old climate change, global warming bullshit. I am tired of hearing this nonsense. President of the United States, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so he has actually changed his mind somewhat recently. He was on, um, uh, he was on 60 Minutes um, recently, and he said, I do think something's happening, something's changing, and it'll change back again, he says. He seems to be pretty certain about that. I don't think it's a hoax. He changed his mind. That's great. I think there's probably a difference, but I don't know that it's man-made. Okay, so this is another common debate that's said. Okay. Um, I will say this. I don't want to give trillions and trillions of dollars. I don't want to lose millions and millions of jobs. So, as a politician, clearly, and as a man who's a deal maker and who cr is a job creator, clearly has an agenda. His agenda is not about saving the environment. His agenda is about creating jobs. Um, you could argue because that's the thing that got him elected. And unfortunately, we find a lot of politicians in a similar place. We find that a lot of politicians are afraid to take on climate change directly because of the repercussions from their electorate base. So now we can move into our first discussion, guys. Uh, I'm glad that we got through it all. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. <laughs> um, we're going to move into our first question. So uh, many people deny climate change. Should we trust scientists? Should we trust the entire scientific establishment and the scientific method? How much should we change our habits based on 
their predictions. So uh, we'll take about uh, 10 minutes for this first one. Um, uh, if you're new here, then I'll say that a small group is probably best uh, somewhere between four and five people. If it gets more than that, it's kind of hard to hear other people talk. So if you can find four or five people around you, even if you don't know them, that's okay. You can say your name. Um, and actually, before going into this, I just want to take one last poll. I, I think this is the last one I'll do. I'm not sure. I just want to see, are there any climate... Are, are there, is there anyone in the audience who doesn't actually believe that climate change is real uh, and that climate change is something that we should be putting a substantial amount of political energy towards. Is there anybody like that here? The audience? Yeah, well, right. I did kind of demonize them, didn't I? Yeah, dear Lord. Nice one, John. All right, well, I'm going to close my eyes, and we can do this again. No. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. All right, well, hopefully it'll come out. Um, for real, we went over it at the beginning. The ground rules are, and I think the most important one, please speak your mind. Please assume positive intent. Really, really, really. We want a, varying, a variation of opinions in here. We don't just want to be talking to the same chorus. We want to be hearing from different groups of people. If you disagree, please let it be known. If anybody's getting aggressive with you, please let me know, and I'll make sure to ask that person to leave. Or maybe we can just solve it kindly, okay? But I don't think it's going to happen. You guys all look like nice people. I'll give you about 10 minutes. Uh, thanks so much, guys. <laughs>